This podcast is brought to you by MakerMinds, a nonprofit organization. MakerMinds aims to spark children's curiosity and enhance their understanding of the world. Welcome to another podcast from the STEM podcast series. I'm your returning host, Arsh. It's really great to be here. Today, I will talk about one of my favorite topics, the art and history of recycling. I continue to learn more on this at school, so I feel I got some of the basics down. Recycling. We all kind of interact with it, but maybe don't fully understand the whole recycling and sustainability thing. That's right. And my goal in this podcast is really to get past some of that common, you know, confusion. I want to unpack where recycling actually came from, understand the real reasons why we need it, and why it feels so tricky right now. I mean, it it really does. And then we can look at some wild possibilities for the future. It feels like everyone's trying to do the right thing with the blue pen, you know? But there's just so much guesswork involved sometimes. Okay, so let's dive into that blue bin and learn a little bit. So let's start right at the beginning. And what's really interesting right off the bat is realizing that reusing materials isn't some new thing. Not at all. My research points to practices going back thousands of years, long before we called it recycling. We're talking ancient history here. Like in the BCs, people were melting down metal, tools, and other objects. Not for the environment, though. No, not back then. It was purely out of necessity, really. Near resources, they weren't always easy to come by. So people had to stretch what they had, right? Bend spoon? Okay, melt it down. Make a nail or something. Resourcefulness was just key. Like the ultimate make, do, and mend. And then we see a more organized version popping up later, like in the U.S. during World War II. That era saw a real push collecting materials like metal, rubber, and even cooking fat. Yeah, specifically channeled into the war effort. So it was necessity again, a coordinated drive for very specific resources. That detail definitely sticks with me. It does. It shows how that kind of purpose-driven collection could be mobilized. But the modern recycling movement, the one focused on environmental impact, seems to be tied to a much later time period. It's the movement we recognize today. It really gained momentum in the 1970s. Think about the first Earth Day. That was 1970. That whole period brought this widespread realization about the sheer volume of waste we were producing and its effect on the environment. So the driver changed. It went from like an individual or national need to a broader environmental consciousness. And why did that modern push really start? What was the core problem that we were trying to solve back then? Well, two major pressures according to my research. First, just the sheer scale of our trash. Yeah, we were simply generating waste faster than we could deal with. Landfills were piling up at an alarming rate. There was this one striking image. Think of a landfill the size of a school, then multiply that by thousands. That's the kind of scale we were facing. The school analogy really makes that physical space issue clear. And second, we were starting to face the reality of resource depletion continuously digging up things like aluminum ore and cutting down forests. I mean, those things have limits, right? And huge environmental costs. And about trees, it's not just about paper. They give us oxygen and squirrels. You don't want to make the squirrels homeless. That's actually a pretty compelling environmental argument right there. It's a memorable way to illustrate why protecting these natural resources matters on, you know, multiple levels. Not just the big abstract stuff. Okay, so we got the history, the big picture, and reasons why recycling became so important. But let's get into the part that causes so much confusion now for people trying to do the right thing. What can actually be recycled? Yeah, this is where it gets really interesting and honestly often frustrating for people. Apparently, the rules aren't universal, which is key, But there are common categories generally accepted, like paper and cardboard, 
aluminum cans like your soda or, you know, root beer cans, glass bottles and jars, and plastic bottles. And this is important. You absolutely need to check the numbers and codes on them, right? Those little numbers in the triangle, they can be confusing. Here are just a few of these codes. Number one, PET, like water bottles. They're widely recyclable. Number two, HDPE, like milk drugs. And they're also widely recyclable. Number three, PVC, like pipes. They're rarely recyclable. Number four, LDPE, like plastic bags. And they're sometimes recyclable, and so on. You have things that look like they should be recyclable, but they often aren't. And that is where the mistakes really happen. Like the dreaded greasy pizza box. Heartbreaking. But the reason is purely practical. That grease, it contaminates the paper fibers, making them unusable for recycling into new paper products. And then there are plastic bags. Huge problem. Because they jam up the sorting machines. It's a serious operational issue. These flexible films, they literally get tangled in the machinery. Causes breakdowns, cost delays. Yeah, it's a nightmare for the facilities. Okay, so no plastic bags in the bin. Got it. What else? Other common culprits for the non-recycling bin often include small mixed material items. Think toothbrushes, most snack wrappers like those crinkly ones, and broken plastic toys. So even if it's plastic, if it's small or like made of different kinds of stuff mixed together, it might not work. That's important. The automated sorting facilities are designed for specific sizes, shapes, and material types, right? Flexible films, like bags or those really small rigid items, they often just literally fall through the cracks or they get misidentified by the machines, which causes problems down the line. And this leads directly to that concept of wish cycling. Yes, wish cycling. It perfectly captures that common impulse, doesn't it? You're trying to be good. You hope something can be recycled, so you just toss it in even if you're not really sure. It's driven by good intentions, definitely, but it can actually harm the whole process. People putting, like, half-eaten bananas in the recycling bin. It belongs in compost, obviously. Or those peanut butter jars with giant globs still inside. Yes, they need a rinse. Guessing and hoping it sorts itself out somehow? Not good. Those aren't just little mistakes. We need to understand how contamination happens and the critical consequences. If you introduce too much contamination, like that greasy pizza box or unrinsed food containers or just loads of non-recyclable items mixed in, the entire batch of otherwise good recyclables can be rejected at the sorting facility. The whole thing, the whole bin load, or even a whole truckload. Sometimes it gets sent to the landfill instead. So one greasy container, or maybe a few plastic bags, can potentially ruin a whole bin's worth of perfectly good recyclables. It can, and that feels incredibly inefficient and frustrating. Did you know that only 5% of recyclable waste actually gets recycled because of this? It's really annoying, and it's a major systematic challenge right now. See, the value of recycled materials depends heavily on their purity. Contaminated batches are much harder and more expensive to process. They're less valuable to the manufacturers who might buy the recycled material. It just makes the whole system less effective, less economic. So what does this all mean for, you know, for you, the listener? Standing there with that questionable yogurt cup or whatever you have over your bin? It's complicated, and one wrong thing can mess it all up. An important message here is to know your local rules. Yes, local rules. Recycling guidelines are not standardized across the country. They're not even always standardized between neighboring towns. Sometimes, really, what's accepted can vary significantly based on what your local sorting facility can handle and what the markets are like for different materials in your area. I know this is super confusing. It's not ideal, but understanding your specific town or city's guide is a critical step. It's like finding the cheat codes for your area. Know your local cheat codes. So, despite these complexities 
and the whole wish cycling problem. Is there hope on the horizon? I think so. There are some fascinating future possibilities. This is where it gets really interesting. There's definitely innovation happening that could fundamentally change how we recycle. Like what, you may ask? There's something called chemical recycling. This basically breaks down plastics to their basic molecular building blocks. Think of plastic as being made of Legos, right? Chemical recycling takes it all apart brick by individual bricks. You can then build completely new high quality plastic products from that original material, not just downcycling it, turning old plastic back into essentially new plastic building blocks. That could be a potential game changer. It could be, especially for plastics that are maybe impossible to recycle mechanically right now. It offers a pathway, yes, and a way to create potentially much higher quality recycled content. And then you have things like smart bins starting to appear. The ones that could like scan your trash and tell you if you messed up. The potential robot garbage teacher. Maybe a bit intimidating, but imagine the reduction of contamination if people got that kind of real-time feedback. Imagine your bin talking back at you. Nope, that doesn't go there. And further down the line, AI and sorting facilities. Yeah, the use of artificial intelligence. So we'll actually have robots judging our recycling habits. Well, maybe not judging you personally, but more like using a AI to identify and separate materials with much greater speed and accuracy than current mechanical systems can. It's a significant leap from, you know, the manual sorting of earlier eras or even today's less sophisticated machinery. It could really help us capture more valuable materials and reduce that contamination problem on a much larger scale. It's incredible to think about that whole journey from ancient folks melting metal out of pure necessity through wartime collection, the environmental awakening of the 70s, struggling with today's confusing contamination-prone systems, all the way to AI-powered sorting and molecular recycling. Wow, we've covered a lot of ground. And for you, listening and reflecting on all of this, there are a few clear actionable steps that emerge from what we've explored despite all the complexities. Know your local recycling guidelines. Seriously, your city or co county website is almost certainly the place to look. Get those local cheat codes. Second, make sure you rinse your recyclables, especially food containers. How clean do they need to be? You don't need them to be bubble bath clean, but remove the leftover food residue. That stuff can contaminate the paper or other materials in the bin. So not disgusting, basically. Third, think about reusing things when possible, even before you get to the recycling bin step, right? Turning a pickle jar into a pencil holder, that kind of thing. Simple, practical reuse is often the best first step. It reduces waste altogether. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. And fourth, share what you learn. Tell other people. Spread your knowledge. So many people genuinely don't know some fundamental facts, like Many common plastics, think plastic cutlery, often aren't accepted in standard recycling bins, or that they aren't biodegradable if they end up in a landfill. Helping others understand that helps reduce that wish cycling for everyone. Those are really concrete steps to take away from this podcast. It definitely makes you look at your own habits and that blue bin a little differently. And as you process all of this, remember these. When in doubt, throw it out, so you don't mess up the whole bin. Or check your local recycling guide, even if it's boring. Just pretend it's a treasure map. And it really does lead to treasure if you think about the effect it might have. We have shared this kind of universal goal of sustainability, right? And the simplest, most universally understood reason why we should even bother trying to save the Earth is simply this. It's the only planet with pizza. That's a hard point to argue with. A very good reason, don't you think? Well, thank you for joining this discussion on recycling and sustainability. I hope that you feel a little more informed, maybe a bit empowered to navigate this important topic. Keep exploring and learning. Until next time on the STEM podcast series.